Hey everyone, and welcome to Tony for Abandon All Hope, Ye Who Enter. Uh, I'm Tony for you. In all the layers of hell, there are but a few demons that hold the title of Prince. Representing the seven deadly sins, these great princes are evil incarnate and embody everything immoral within the human spirit. Today, we will dive deep into the seven beings that rule over the unfathomable planes of hell, each with their own story, domain, and, of course, primary mode of torturing humans. Each entry will shed more light on not only the demonic horde we're meant to fight against, but also the very nature of a person's soul and how easy it is to fall into a life of sin. Knowledge is power, so let's learn what we can about those who would see us suffer. Without any further ado, let's talk about the seven princes of hell. This video was made possible by the great people over at my Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Also, I have a Discord, so if you want to come chat with me and other wannabe theologists, come join and hang out. To understand Beelzebub, we must first understand his domain, gluttony. This sin may seem self-explanatory at first, it's just eating a lot of food, right? Well, there's a lot more to it than that. As one of the seven deadly sins, it is specifically a desire for food that withholds it from the needy. A selfishness that causes others to suffer for lack of consideration or moderation. The etymology of the word can be traced back to the Latin word glutide, which means to gulp down or to swallow. The entirety of this sin is focused on the consumption of food, which may seem like a pretty shallow subject to dedicate a deadly sin to. But food has always and will always be one of the most important aspects of human life, stemming from our earliest days as a species. To get deeper into the subject, from the Bible and old religious scholars, they break down gluttony in many different aspects. First, and most simple to understand, is the overconsumption of food. The ability to control yourself and only consume what was necessary for your survival and the survival of people around you was a great skill to have. If you've ever watched a TLC show, you'd know it's shocking how much food can fit in a human stomach, and it can easily lead to the breakdown of a human body if overindulged. The same was true back then as well. The heavier you became, the less productive and effective you are when it comes to serving the needs of yourself, your family, and your country. Being overweight in the olden times would also greatly increase your risk of sickness and disease, much like now, except they didn't have pills to lower your blood pressure or insulin shots. People would literally just die. Another incarnation of gluttony comes from the eagerness in which one takes food, that is to say, the lack of consideration for yourself and others in the pursuit of short-term desire. We've all heard of terms like hangry, which is colloquially understood to be the state of anger induced by being hungry. Our emotions, despite how enlightened we claim to be as a species, are largely based on bodily functions. Whether you've eaten quality food, slept a comfortable amount of time at night, and whether you've exercised recently all have an effect. Hunger can lead a man to do terrible things. Stealing food is even somewhat understandable in cases of extreme hunger for most people. And for extreme examples, in life or death scenarios, even murder. Despite this, temperance and fasting are incredibly important parts of many world religions, from Abrahamic religions like Islam's Ramadan to historical Buddhist practices of meditation for extended periods of time. It's important for a person to overcome the simple base desires of the brain. Many are quick or rash decisions they make and will regret later when they're not hungry. And it isn't limited to just eating one too many pieces of cake. In the story of Jacob and Esau from the Bible, Esau sold his birthright to his brother Jacob for ordinary food, like bread and lentil soup. Granted, him and his father were tricked into doing so, but a sound mind could have seen through the deception. As followers of God or pursuers of a unified spirit, it's important to transcend the base impulses we may have. The urge to consume is a necessity of human life, but through temperance and understanding, you can live within your means and treat your body like a temple. For a long time, there was a link between the overconsumption of food and a lack of moral character. This leads us to another interpretation of gluttony, which is ironically the seeking of delicacies or simply satiating a palate of luxury and decadence rather than necessity. In many households, even today, you eat what you're given, or what is available, no complaining. The same was very much true for people throughout history. Since ancient times, only the rich and wealthy were able to consume decadent food, so in turn, the gluttonous pigs that took advantage of the working peasants were seen as wanting in virtue. 
To the starving, the idea of turning away good food simply because it doesn't suit your refined palate is seen as incredibly wasteful. And there were always citizens of a kingdom that could do with more food and drink to help them, but the nobles couldn't care less. Simply eating for the sake of eating is to be frowned upon, and the more extravagant the meal, the more wasteful it must be in turn. But just because the more likely to sin is the rich, doesn't mean the ordinary folk don't do the same on occasion. The most famous story of this gluttony is from Numbers chapter 11. The famous Bible story states, The rabble with them began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost, also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. The manna they spoke of was a type of seed that looked like a resin, which they would crush into paste and eat for survival. It wasn't described as being very tasty. Moses was so inundated with complaints from the lack of variety in the Israelites' food that he even asked God to kill him, saying, I cannot carry all these people by myself. The burden is too heavy for me. If this is how you are going to treat me, please go ahead and kill me, if I have found favor in your eyes, and do not let me face my own ruin. Seeing that his people were so selfish and gluttonous that they even said they regretted escaping slavery because they missed the food their masters gave them, God enacted some poetic justice. Later on, it states, Now a wind went out from the Lord and drove quail in from the sea. It scattered them up two cubits, deep all around the camp, as far as a day's walk in any direction. All that day and night, and all the next day, the people went out and gathered quail. No one gathered less than ten homers, then they spread them out all around the camp. But while the meat was still between their teeth, and before it could be consumed, the anger of the Lord burned against the people, and he struck them with a severe plague. Therefore, the place was named Kibroth Hatava, because there they buried the people who had craved other food. The name Kibroth Hatava translates to Graves of Craving. Next time you're feeling picky and refuse food given to you, or think to yourself, just one more couldn't hurt, think again. Be thankful for what you have, and leave enough for the people around you to be happy and healthy. Now on to the demon king of gluttony, Beelzebub, Lord of the Flies. The origin of the name Beelzebub can be traced back to a Philistine god within the city of Ekron. In ancient Ugaritic, the word Baal means Lord, but was also the name of a deity within the region. This Baal was lord of fertility and storms, but even within the Semitic religion, he was decried as a false god and usurper of the true god, El. The city of Ekron worshipped Baal, or at least used the honorific Baal to refer to their protector deity. Some interpretations have the citizens of the region referring to their god as Baal Zebul, which means lord of the heavenly dwelling. But many people spoke of their interaction with the worshippers of this deity as being very unpleasant. Contemporary works have the Israelites referring to this god as Baal Zebub, meaning Lord of the Flies, as a derogatory jab basically telling them to feed on excrement, if you know what I mean. Even within the Ugaritic texts of this region, they speak of this god expelling flies from his body, so it makes sense. The demon itself does not make many appearances overtly in the Bible. There are only a few instances of the word Beelzebub used, and they are simply as insults used against others, such as when the Pharisee accused Jesus of conspiring with demons to drive out demons from other people. Later on, this once great god of Ekron was adopted as a demon within Judeo-Christian mythology. In the Testament of Solomon, Beelzebul, the original spelling, appears as Prince of the Demons, and it states that he was formerly a leading heavenly angel who was associated with the planet Venus or the Morning Star. These attributes are often associated with Lucifer himself, which is why many people think Beelzebub or Lord of the Flies to simply be another title given to the Prince of Darkness, but they are very much separate entities. In Christian tradition, Beelzebub is placed high in Hell's hierarchy, and is said to have been one of the three fallen angels alongside Lucifer and Leviathan. Leviathan is said to be the entrance to Hell itself, or the Hell Mouth. Lucifer is the ruler of Hell, and Beelzebub is a close second in command. Chief Lieutenant of Hell's armies and Prince of Demons, he is closely associated with the sin of gluttony and the worship of false gods. The most interesting interpretation of this demon in occult literature is the reason he is tied to gluttony in the first place. Many believe that Beelzebub has an insatiable hunger for the suffering and temptation of humans. 
On many occasions, in demonology as well as historical occult literature, Beelzebub conspires against the leaders of man, like kings and religious scholars, yet he never fully eradicates their belief in the Lord. Once again, within the Testament of Solomon, it states that Beelzebub causes destruction through tyrants, demons to be worshipped among men, excites priests to lust, to cause jealousies in cities and murders, and to bring about war. His hunger to see humans fall to temptation only at the height of their power is insatiable, and Beelzebub makes sure never to fully stamp out the light of hope when his deeds are done. In the Salem witch trials, Beelzebub is the demon cited most often tempting young women of the time to become witches only for them to be burned at the stake. It can be inferred that the power and temptation that Beelzebub offers was never truly there, but rather a trick of the mind inciting great sin into the mind of the believer, which will always lead to their downfall and the soul descending into the realm of hell, to be reshaped into a demon led by none other than Beelzebub himself. In Shin Megami Tensei, Beelzebub appears in two distinct forms, first appearing in the series with his human form, an enormously overweight and imposing man wearing the skin of a tiger, while also donning a staff and necklace made of human bones. This incarnation is the representation of him as the god of Ekron, Philistine stronghold and false usurper god of the region. With blue skin and intense vein definition, he looks almost alien and extremely dangerous. His later design portrays him in his true form as the Lord of the Flies. Here, as an enormous insect still holding the human bone scepter and necklace, the upright demonic fly drapes the tiger skin pelt over his head and curls his body with eyes forward larvae ready to be spewed out of his backside to give birth to new powerful demons to do his bidding. He is always an incredibly powerful demon of the vile or tyrant race, capable of dealing immense physical as well as magical damage, with even the power to instantly kill a party if you're not prepared. Having two incarnations is an amazing choice for this demon as he is believed to have two origins, and even two modes of operation sometimes depicted as a false god worshipped by man in place of the Almighty, and sometimes as a dark tempter and prince of demons in hell. Two amazing designs representing one of the most interesting demons in history. To understand Asmodeus, we must first understand his domain, lust. Let's try not to get demonetized instantly with this explanation. Lust as a sin is not necessarily tied to sexuality, though it often is synonymous with lecherous thoughts. It's an intense desire for something, but this desire is unique due to its iron grip on one's mind. To desire something in and of itself is obviously not a sin, as each person is unique in what they value and hope to achieve. When one desires to accomplish, acquire, or create something, it can be a beautiful process of persistence and self-improvement. In truth, that is what we would call passion. If you wish to create wonderful dishes for people to enjoy, achieve a higher status at work, or get to know that special someone a little bit better, it can be a beautiful thing. When these desires overtake us and it becomes impossible to think or strive for anything else though, it can quickly devolve into the sin of lust. A lust for power can make it much easier to ignore the people you hurt along the way. A lust to hone your craft, whatever it may be, can completely isolate you from the outside world and skew your perception of reality. And obviously, a lust for another person, if taken too far, can lead to at least the dehumanization of the other being, reducing them to simply a piece of meat. Or at worst, can lead to some of the most horrible crimes a person can commit. The difference between passion and lust is important to draw, but oftentimes it gets hard to understand them, and in truth, one can sway between the two depending on the day. Lust is often a temporary mindset, thankfully, as once your lust is fulfilled, you oftentimes revert back to normal, but then you are left with the realization you may have made a complete fool of yourself. How many of us wanted something so badly, but when we get it, it's just alright. And commonly, we don't really like it as much as we thought we would. Not to get too crass, but the term post-nut clarity comes to mind, though I won't go too much deeper into that, I'm trying to be for all ages here. But let's bring it back to reality for a moment, since for the sake of definition, it's easy to go to the extremes. The average person doesn't lust for immense power or revert to a base, single-minded state when they see a piece of food after all. Though some people still get reduced to gibbering monkeys when they see someone attractive, the sad truth is that lust is definitely a sin we have all been guilty of on more than a few occasions in our lives. 
Lust is a state of compromised decision-making due to an intense desire for something immoral. With lust being one of the most common sins a person can commit, it's widely considered to be the least serious of the capital sins. But the range in which one can feel lust varies to such a degree that the punishment can be feeling slightly disappointed in yourself or jail time. While there is no objective morality, you would be hard-pressed to find many people that thought someone who was willing to acquire something at any and all cost to be a healthy way of conducting yourself. While lust can be the mindset attached to other sins, such as gluttony for the lust of food and greed for the lust of wealth, the most obvious and pure example of lust is that of the sexual variety. It comes with the territory of being human, as an element of sexual attraction is absolutely necessary for a relationship to start and flourish. Despite how much we all want to say we only care about personality, a first impression can mean a lot, and how you choose to express yourself physically is a point of pride for many people. The problem comes when the desire for someone starts and stops at just that, the purely physical. Many religions from across the world have specific passages warning against and giving guidance to avoid such base and carnal feelings. Perhaps most famously in the Gospel of Matthew in the Bible, where it states, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Quite an intense passage, but one that drives home the importance of keeping your thoughts moral and clean. Allowing a thought to seep into your mind at first might be troubling, but you must understand it's immoral and throw it away. When a thought is so intrusive that it starts to cloud your judgment and betray the trust of others, even if it's just in your head, it's your duty to remove the very roots of the idea itself. Divorce yourself from the origin of the sin, even if it means pain and discomfort. Now, you obviously shouldn't gouge out your eye or cut off your hand literally, but correcting a sin is never easy and it may involve some sacrifice. Thoughts have power, and thinking about something enough can normalize it to you. Let's say you lust after another person's wife. If you think about it enough, you may find yourself in a situation where you can act on those thoughts, and what will wait for you may not be a literal hell, but the destruction of something that was once beautiful, and it will all be your fault. In a very similar fashion, Buddhism and many other Eastern religions have lust in a core position of their philosophy. Lust to the Buddhist can be understood as the attachment and passionate desire for that which exists in the world, more specifically, it's anything that provides us form, sensation, perception, mentality, and consciousness. Basically, anything you can see, touch, or eat. Thus, we can understand the meaning of the Four Noble Truths in Buddhism. Those being 1. Life involves suffering. 2. Suffering is caused by desire. 3. There is a way to eliminate the suffering inherent in life. And 4. The elimination of desire will, therefore, eliminate the suffering of life. Sounds simple, right? But if it was, we'd all be Buddhas. And many people go through their entire lives without ever truly grasping even the first truth. With the knowledge of desire being specifically tied to that which is in the corporeal world, we can understand that this lust is the desire for worldly things. Anything of this earth is temporary, and therefore of no true use to oneself. On the other hand, that which we cannot see is what is truly important. Knowledge and understanding, love and respect, and providing for a better tomorrow are that which we must value above all else. That which will provide us good karma, and that which will eliminate suffering. A universal principle that holds true, regardless of religion or upbringing, is to value what is beyond the physical, so that you may be happy for a lifetime, rather than a moment. Now on to the lecherous prince himself, Asmodeus. His appearances are mostly relegated to non-canonical books of the Bible and other Abrahamic texts. One such book, and the text that will shed some light on Asmodeus, is the Book of Tobit. The book centers around a righteous man named Tobit and his son Tobias. Tobit one day had his face a little too close to the windowsill when a bird decided to poop on his eyes, permanently blinding him. Yes, I'm serious. 
This unfortunate event made Tobit rely on his son to run most of his errands for him. Sometime later, Tobit asked his son Tobias to go to the city of Medea to retrieve some money he previously lent out to a man living there. The city was quite far off and Tobit was at first reluctant to entrust his son with the task. But Tobias assured his father he would get a righteous man to lead him on the way. Tobias did end up finding a man perfectly suited to guide him on his journey. A man named Azariah. The book then switches perspectives to a woman named Sarah, whose life has been completely taken over by our very own demon, Asmodeus. This woman from a very wealthy family has every single potential suitor perish on the night of their wedding, leading to the public believing her to be a twisted mass murderer. In truth, the culprit for these killings is the demon Asmodeus, who preys on the lust the suitors feel leading up to the wedding night. Then, when they are about to consummate the marriage, he tightly grabs hold of their soul fully given over to lust and sin, resulting in their immediate death. Returning back to the traveling duo, Azariah does many miraculous things like plucking out massive fish from rivers with little effort, explaining how their innards can be used to heal many ailments. Tobias doesn't fully understand, but he keeps the innards of the fish regardless. Eventually, they make their way to the city of Medea, which also happens to be where Sarah is located, where they meet. Azariah seemingly randomly turns to Tobias and tells him to marry the woman. Now Tobias at this point knows all about the fate of the woman's suitors, but against his better judgment, decides to put his faith in Azariah. Tobias gets the blessing of Sarah's father and Azariah tells him for three days to pray with Sarah, hand in hand, then burn the innards of the fish they ate of on their journey. This ritual kept the great demon lord Asmodeus at bay. On the third day, they would consummate the marriage, and on the fourth day, they would be blessed with a child. This process is to be done with no lust in your heart, but simply the love of children. The young couple does as Azariah commands, and after the ritual is over, Sarah's family is astounded at the man's survival. They fully incorporate Tobias into their family, and provide for him a life of luxury he would have never known. Tobias could not forget about his father, however, and after admittedly way too long of a time for a simple errand, Tobias finally went home with Azariah and is instructed once again on what to do. Tobias, as instructed by Azariah, smears the remaining fish guts on Tobit's eyes and kisses him, where he is almost instantly granted his sight back. It's then that Azariah reveals himself to be the Archangel Raphael, sent directly from God to heal Tobit and rid Sarah of her demonic possession. Not much is revealed about Asmodeus directly from this story, other than his opportunistic ways of leading men to their deaths at the height of their lust, and his apparent strength due to the only thing even able to keep him at bay being one of the four main archangels. Another, more spicy incarnation of Asmodeus is within the story of King Solomon, here called Ashmadai. This king became infamous for summoning and utilizing demons in the construction of the Israelite kingdom during the First Temple period. With these demons, he became nigh on invulnerable to harm, granted knowledge of all worldly things and unparalleled wealth and power. During his reign, Solomon one day decided to visit a demon he had recently imprisoned by the name of Ashmadai. This demon granted Solomon the knowledge of the perfect building materials for the kingdom, but the ruler was curious as to the actual power of the entity. Ashmedai told Solomon that if he's really interested in seeing his power, then he would have to take off his protective signet ring and unbind him. Solomon foolishly obliged the demon's request, upon which the great wings of the beast blew him 400 miles away from his kingdom. This didn't kill the good king as he still had the protection of countless other demons, but in his absence, Ashmedai assumed Solomon's form and played king for as long as he could before the real one got back. The demon got up to a lot of general evil, but ultimately he was most interested in Solomon's many wives. Ashmedai fornicated with each of them nightly, but even this was not enough to sate the great demon of lust's appetite, and he eventually forced himself upon Solomon's own mother, Bathsheba. The demon's hatred for Solomon knew no bounds after his imprisonment. After the true king made his way back to the land, he could not believe his eyes at the destruction the demon caused and the way he treated his loved ones while tricking them into believing he had turned into a monster. Ashmedai dropped his guise when he saw Solomon and he knew his fun had come to an end. But before he left, he foretold of the great kingdom's downfall and also presumably saying I banged your mom, which may have been the first time that insult was ever used. 
Despite the demon fleeing from Solomon, it was said that the king lived the rest of his days in fear and burning hatred for what Ashmedai did to him and his family, sleeping with a permanent guard for fear of his return in the dead of night. Asmodeus's depictions can be traced back to the Dictionnaire Infernal, or the Infernal Dictionary, by Jacques Colin de Plancy, a 19th century grimoire of demons, and the Lesser Key of Solomon, a chronicle of all 72 demons summoned and utilized by King Solomon during his reign. The Infernal Dictionary describes him as a being with the breast of a man, a cock leg, serpent tail, and three heads, one of a man spitting fire, one of a sheep, and one of a bull riding a lion with dragon wings and neck. Each of these creatures are related to lust or sin in many cultures in some way. In the Lesser Key of Solomon, he is described in a similarly strange way, describing him as strong, powerful, and with three heads, the first like a bull, the second like a man, and the third like a ram or goat, the tail of a serpent, and from his mouth issue flames of fire. Even in this depiction, he is said to sit upon an infernal dragon, holding a lance and banner, which represents his status as a demon prince of many legions in hell. Asmodeus is perhaps the most terrifying demon, as his hold on humans reduces them to mere animals, ready to enact the worst evils on each other, all while he laughs and drinks up the sin. Remember to keep your mind clear and clean, or you may be reduced to a thoughtless monster, no different from a demon. In Shin Megami Tensei, Asmodeus is depicted in a very wide range, some accurate and some less so. First appearing in Megami Tensei 2 as a dragon-like being with three heads, one of a bull, one of a human, and one of a ram, much like his occult interpretations. Then, the demon takes a very long hiatus from the series, returning in Shin Megami Tensei 4 as a blood-red, almost reptilian creature made of bones studded with countless piercings holding a ring of keys. Despite his less than accurate design, he appears in the game as a guardian of the birdcage imprisoning the four archangels, and during the fight with Flynn, proclaims he will kill the man and take his companion Isabeau as his wife. Creepy. His role in the story harkens back to his rivalry with the archangels, specifically Raphael, and his appearance in a prison could be a reference to his imprisonment and subsequent escape from the prison of Solomon all those years ago. The Demon of Lust appears again as the true form of Kamoshida's shadow during the fight with him in Persona 5. This fits perfectly as the former Olympian turned high school coach Kamoshida is known to abuse the male students and horrifically harass and even assault the female ones. The boss is shown to indulge in every sinful act at once, wearing a crown and wielding a leather whip designed to induce as much pain as possible. His other hands have a knife, fork, and wine glass to consume the bodies of his female students, with the males gagged and chained to his golden throne. Throughout the series, despite not having many appearances, he always ends up being one of the most powerful and memorable designs. To understand Belphegor, one must understand his domain, the deadly sin of sloth. One of the main seven deadly sins within Christian tradition, but possibly the least understood one. Sloth is commonly understood as simple laziness, but that isn't entirely true. The word sloth is translated from the Latin term acidia, which means without care. Initially, the word acidia meant a myriad of different things. Spiritually, acidia referred to religious people becoming indifferent to their duties as they pertain to God. One of the faith must always believe, and to undergo their duties without reason is meaningless in the eyes of God. Belief carries everything. Mentally, acidia refers to those who lack feelings for others and even themselves, the mindset which a person is quick to boredom, agitation, and most commonly apathy. A lack of care for yourself and your fellow man may seem harmless at first, but humans aren't meant to be alone, and that type of antisocial behavior potentially gives rise to more extreme emotions and feelings. If you don't care even about yourself, it's easy for others not to care about you either, and feelings of isolation and loneliness can lead to extreme and dark places. Physical acedia is the most straightforward to understand, simply the lack of movement. This is most likely where Sloth's modern interpretation came from, but it goes much deeper than that. Essentially, one who is physically committing acedia would have general indifference to work as a whole, and back in contemporary times, indifference to work could cause serious trouble. Unlike now, where if you didn't feel like working, even for an extended period of time, you could call in sick or even go on vacation, which would very rarely be looked down upon. 
Even someone getting fed up with their job and moving on is completely understandable, but in early life it was not so simple. An apathetic farmer could lead to the deaths of his animals and potentially the starvation of his family and kingdom. An apathetic builder could lead to damaged structures and potentially the deaths of many innocent people. Perhaps the most obvious to see harmful outcome, this physical acedia immediately leads to negative outcomes for everyone relying on the work of others, something easy to overlook, even now. The book Experiencing Spirituality, Finding Meaning Through Storytelling by Ernest Kurtz and Catherine Ketchum refers to sloth as self-pity, as the entire mindset conveys not only the mental depression one feels, but also the selfish base it is founded upon. Sadly, this was most likely the people at the time's interpretation of depression and other such mental illnesses. In regards to religious belief, sloth is considered one of the most grave sins. Religious officials believe sloth not only leads to an inert state of being, but also a mind which is ignorant to even the good deeds of others and blessings of God. Those experiencing sloth are slow to recognize their gifts and quick to selfish anger and envy of others. Sloth also precludes an individual from accepting the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost, the antithesis of the seven deadly sins, which are as follows. Wisdom, understanding, counsel, knowledge, piety, fortitude, and fear of God. To hold dear and encompass these virtues are what makes a human good and holy in the eyes of others and God. But to those experiencing sloth, it is impossible. A lack of care for wisdom and understanding, a lack of movement to seek out counsel and knowledge, and a grand ignorance to spiritual fortitude and fear of God. Sloth, in and of itself, precludes one from accepting these gifts wholly and truly, and a person's heart must be changed before they can begin to understand life. Unfortunately, unlike other sins which are easily caught and either rectified or punished accordingly, sloth is a sin of inaction rather than action and not so easily spotted or called out. Sloth can come about as a result of other sins or vice versa, but when the worrying trend emerges that one is suffering from sloth, there isn't much others can do to help. In some cases, the slothful can go through their entire lives not understanding they have committed a grave sin, and simply coast through existence never attaining anything of note or challenging themselves in any way, shunning the gifts given to them, all because they simply had to reach out and grab it. Through struggle, sacrifice, and suffering, one can achieve enlightenment. That sentiment is shared by almost every single world religion, yet it is much easier said than done, and very few will ever truly understand its meaning. The punishment for sloth may be difficult to dole out on earth, but in Dante Alighieri's magnum opus, Dante's Divine Comedy, the punishment for those who commit sloth is depicted. Specifically in Purgatorio, on the fourth terrace of the mountain of Purgatory, the slothful reside. Here, Dante's guide Virgil explains how sloth is the effect of an insufficient amount of love. According to Virgil, essentially, love is what derives someone's desires and actions. When love is put towards good deeds to others and the self, such as the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost as well as charity and prayer, a man is whole and the love is pure. When love is put towards selfish desires and hedonism, such as the seven deadly sins as well as crime and blasphemy, a man is doomed to never understand his true potential. The free will of humans allows us to turn away from God and value nothing but indulging our base wants and desires, but it also allows the truest form of righteousness. As the holiness in one's heart is never forced upon us through God, but a conscious choice to be good to ourselves and others. Those who are punished for the sin of sloth are forced to run without rest for eternity while constantly being reminded of the good deeds of holy people on earth. The counterpart to sloth is zeal, and the punishment is quite fitting, if a little unimaginative. Those who were so dejected and lazy in life, being forced to not only exert their bodily energy, but strain their mental energy as well in reliving the extreme deeds done by those who were filled with the Holy Spirit in life. It's important to note though that regardless of this book being a masterpiece in its own right, it isn't Christian canon. I just thought it was worth mentioning. Now that we understand the sin of sloth, we can understand the one who created it, and in a very unique way. The demon Belphegor has had many interpretations over the years, from occult literature to the old Jewish mystic tradition of Kabbalah. In one story, Belphegor was once a member of the angelic choir close to God's throne. Before the war in heaven, Lucifer thought himself above God and rallied one-third of all angels to fight alongside him in a battle to overthrow the Most High. Belphegor was not among these angels who rebelled, 
But oddly enough, he was neither among the angels that fought on behalf of God, simply watching with a lack of enthusiasm for any one side in particular. When Lucifer was defeated and cast out of heaven, eyes turned to Belphegor for answers as to his actions, or I guess inaction. As expected, Belphegor didn't have much of anything to say and was cast out alongside the fallen angels as a deserter to God's army. When he fell into the pits of hell, Lucifer took a liking to Belphegor, despite him literally doing nothing, and granted him the title of Prince of Hell. Talk about failing upwards. Lucifer saw great potential in Belphegor's disposition, as inaction is just what evil needs to proliferate, and if enough people remain lazy and ignorant, they will allow the greatest of horrors to become commonplace. For seemingly no good reason, Belphegor came to have an incredibly high rank in the realms of Hell, and is quite possibly the most important prince of them all, as he paves the way for all other sins. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, all sins caused by ignorance have laziness as their root, and the originator for the sin of sloth is none other than Belphegor. Whether sin is derived from laziness or laziness is derived from sin, Belphegor is involved in some way to ensure humans always have the temptation of quitting their struggle and passion for an easy life of greed and excess. Best of all, this demon doesn't even need to do anything in particular to tempt humans. Simply preying on humans' willingness to take the easy way out and turn a blind eye is enough to please Lucifer. In other stories, where Belphegor is surprisingly more active, Lucifer sent him to Earth to spread his influence to the world. Lucifer gave him a special task, and that was to find out if true love did exist, as well as if it could be truly sanctified with the ritual of marriage. If Belphegor were to understand true love, his next task is to figure out how to manipulate and pervert it into a means to serve the Prince of Darkness. Belphegor went on his way and took a particular shine to the country of France. After some time, Belphegor came back to report his findings, to which he stated that love does not exist. What humans call love is simply the result of a hormonal release or the simple fear of loneliness. This report is inconclusive, however, as whether or not Belphegor actually researched the subject is unclear. He is the demon of sloth, after all. Belphegor also has a unique association with the sin of lust in some way. In the Bible, Belphegor is not mentioned explicitly, but a being of remarkably similar purpose appears, named Baal of Pure. In the book of Numbers chapter 25, it speaks of the Israelite people entering the city of Shittim in the Moabite region. The women of the region immediately set their sight on the men and seduced them to indulge within the walls of the city. Reveling in the feasts and women, the Israelites fell into sin and even went so far as to sacrifice for their Moabite god. So Israel yoked themselves to the Baal of Pure, and the Lord's anger burned them. Throughout the Bible and history in general, the easiest way to bring about the downfall of someone, even the holiest of men, is to tempt them with women and food. Reverting a man back to his most base desires leads to a death of the spirit and willingness to do anything to keep their life easy. This grave treachery would not go unpunished, however, and later, Moses says to the Israelite judges, each of you must put to death those of your people who have yoked themselves to the Baal of Pure. Throughout the Bible, the Baal of Pure is referred to as a being as well as a place, so it's uncertain if Belphegor was the demon in question that seduced the Israelites. If the demon's name was derived from this incident, it would make a lot of sense. Later in the chapter, it's revealed that the women were charged to seduce the Israelites by King Balak, though some theologists believe the women may not have even been real, but rather a conjuration of the demon Belphegor or Baal of Pure to tempt humans further into depravity and giving up their lofty ideals. Belphegor, quite fittingly, is depicted often as a horned devil who sits upon an enormous toilet he uses as a throne, and he dares not get up from since it's too much effort. Despite being so simple, you immediately know what he's all about, just from his depictions. In Shin Megami Tensei, Belphegor is depicted pretty much one-to-one -one with his real-life occult counterpart. A horned devil with a long spiked tail sitting upon a large toilet. On his porcelain throne, this demon wears golden gloves and footwear, which is just enough armor to protect some parts of the body, but not too cumbersome so as to disturb his comfortable sitting position. Despite being the demon of sloth, he's depicted as extremely muscular, though who knows if this is his true form or just a body he uses to appear more menacing towards others. Belphegor appears as a fallen, tyrant, and vile race throughout the game, which are all extremely fitting. Fallen due to his status as a fallen angel, tyrant due to his title of the Prince of Hell, and vile due to... 
Well, what do you think he does all day based on that design? Overall, an extremely well done demon, which fans seem to love, myself included. To understand Leviathan, we must first understand his domain, Envy. This sin is one that is very much tied to our early existence as a species. Witnessing the prosperity of another and wanting it for yourself is not always a bad thing. In truth, that is a benign form of jealousy. This feeling can drive and motivate us to be on the same level as another who has what we desire. A feeling that drives us to motivation and a feeling that drives us to anger are very different things however, so jealousy and envy ought to be separated and clearly defined. You might be motivated to work harder by a friend who was recently recognized for his talents, be it in art, sports, or the workplace. You would feel happy for him and want what he has, but would never take it away from him. However, when you hear about a celebrity who bought their third mansion in Europe, it might anger you to the point you wish you could tear it all down from the unfairness compared to your life, despite the fact you might do the same in their position. No matter how justified you might be in pointing out the unfairness of both qualities of life, the venomous hatred and hope for violence on another human being is not healthy. This can lead to dehumanization, from seeing someone as a person to simply an idol to be burned. Philosophers and theologians may help shed light on the difference between jealousy and envy more concretely. Aristotle, within his ancient Greek treatise titled Rhetoric, defines envy as the pain caused by the good fortune of others. Quite a short definition, but it can help differentiate the two. Jealousy, while still unpleasant, does not diminish your own life after feeling the emotion. Rather, it signifies wanting to share in the prosperity of another. Envy, on the other hand, signifies a palpable pain within the soul of the one experiencing it when faced with the good fortune of another, wanting to take it away from them and having it for themselves, or in some cases, just wanting to destroy what they have simply because you don't have it. Later in history, Immanuel Kant, one of the most predominant Enlightenment thinkers of the 18th century, wrote in his book Metaphysics of Morals a more lengthy definition of envy. He states it as, a reluctance to see our own well-being overshadowed by another's. Because the standard we use to see how well off we are is not the intrinsic worth of our own well-being, but how it compares with that of others. This definition is a lot more descriptive and understandable, despite the antiquated language. Essentially, he implies that the envious soul is that of one who does not truly understand the gifts of his own circumstances, and can only see them when compared to another. When the envious sees one who is less fortunate, he is happy and content. But when he sees one who overshadows him in that which he values, the fundamental way in which he views his worth is shaken and he is roused to anger. The truly just and righteous soul does not constantly compare their life and happiness to others, but simply compared to their own values and set of ethics. This definition is less so tied to the second party in the envious and the envied relationship, but rather the sinful mindset of the individual constantly comparing themselves to others. Jealousy could be the want to protect what one possesses from others, or the desire to acquire what another has, while envy is a deep resentment at the fact that another has what you ought to have, so much so that you believe your life is worth less for not having it. Transitioning over to the more theological definitions of envy, perhaps there is no better example of the sin than in the first book of the Bible, Genesis. Within the story of Cain and Abel, the two sons of Adam and Eve, they worshipped God unerringly for their entire lives. Abel was a shepherd and gave sacrifices of animals to God, while Cain was a farmer and gave sacrifices of grain and vegetables. Day in and day out, God gave more thanks to Abel's sacrifice than Cain's, which angered the young man greatly. God eventually confronted Cain directly, asking, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Cain didn't listen, however, and eventually ushered his brother Abel to follow him into the forest, where he killed his own brother. When God found out, he cursed Cain to forever wander the world as an outcast, forever cut off from the fruits of the earth. The envy he felt towards his brother was brought on long before the first sacrifice's worth was weighed by God. In truth, the reason why God looked favorably on Abel while turning away from Cain was because of the weight of sin on his heart. 
Cain was guilty of the philosophical definition of envy. He weighed his worth compared to another, despite the fact that both him and his brother were equal and loved. Cain resented his brother for much more than just the sacrifices. To impose your own standards for what is acceptable and good for another, least of all for God, is that sin that is crouching at your door, which will lead you to do terrible things, even murder. Cain failed that test and took the life of an innocent person which damned him for eternity, never truly grasping the weight of his actions and cutting him off from the prosperity he would have felt had he just been content with his own wealth and love he received. Saint Augustine, one of the most prolific theologians and philosophers of the extremely early years of Christianity, calls envy the diabolical sin. From envy are born hatred, detraction, calumny, joy caused by the misfortune of a neighbor, and displeasure caused by his prosperity. Perhaps the most obvious example of this is the reason we're all here in the first place, when war broke out in heaven. The angel Lucifer was once a high rank in the kingdom of heaven. Residing in the seventh layer of heaven, God's throne room, Lucifer was the embodiment of perfection. In mind and body, Lucifer had no equal and was created by God as such. But he had one flaw. His soul was tainted. Lucifer grew envious of God's position, and his pride drove him to plot and scheme to overthrow the Most High. Over time, he gathered the support of one-third of all angels in heaven and launched an assault on the Empyrean. Much to Lucifer's dismay, his assault was not enough and he was beaten back, which forced him onto the front lines. God sent the Archangel Michael to face Lucifer in battle, and by all accounts, Michael was at a disadvantage, but he still rose to the occasion. Lucifer's pride got the better of him and he became desperate, not wanting to fight at full strength for fear of his perfect body being scarred, and not willing to fully engage for even the thought he might lose to an inferior being. Despite all this, it was still a fierce battle, and even transforming into a dragon was not enough. Lucifer was struck down, along with his army of once righteous angels, to become the demons we know today. Lucifer suffering from pride was his most prominent sin, but it was none other than envy that was the root of his corruption, and that which sowed the seeds of his complete and utter downfall. Now that we know what envy is, we ought to know what the opposite is. Love and it's better described nowhere else than in the letter Paul wrote to the Corinthians. While this letter is in the Bible, they can still be followed by anyone. In it, he states, Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when completeness comes, what is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. So, put the ways of childhood behind you. The fullness of life is not what others have that you do not. It's the love we all share, and the happiness that can be derived from it. Now on to the Hellmouth, Leviathan the Eater of Souls. The origin of the Leviathan can be derived from several books in the Hebrew Bible, including the Psalms, the Book of Job, and the Book of Isaiah, along with some non-canonical books like the Book of Enoch. While the idea of a giant sea serpent isn't unique to Christian theology in any way, the Leviathan has some interesting and unique aspects to it. Within Psalms and the Book of Isaiah, Leviathan is not quite the tremendous sea monster we know him to be, and was most likely just a word meaning a large sea-dwelling animal. Isaiah mentions the beast once, and says, In that day the Lord, with his severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent, Leviathan, that twisted serpent, and he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. The context of this passage is the restoration of Israel. With this, we can assume that the Leviathan is a representation of Israel's enemies rather than God coming down to kill a sea serpent for no reason. 
The book of Psalm mentions Leviathan twice, first saying, You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea serpents in the water. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces, and gave him as food to the people inhabiting the wilderness. You broke open the fountain and the flood. You dried up mighty rivers. In this verse, we can understand that the Leviathan is much more than just a mere sea serpent, but still a far cry from the horrible demonic beast we know him as today. So it still must not be THE Leviathan. The second mention of the beast in Psalm and the Book of Job paint a picture of the Leviathan that is much more terrifying. This great and wide sea, in which are innumerable teeming things, living things both small and great. There the ships sail about. There is that Leviathan, which you have made to play there. These all wait for you, that you may give them their food in due season. The context of this passage is praising God and his ability to provide for all he has created, even the mightiest of sea serpents who dwell in the deepest parts of the abyss. The juxtaposition between the small fishing boats paired with a leviathan whose mass is so great it would consume those boats without so much as a thought is terrifying. But the passage states that even with our great differences, we all rely on God and were creations of him. And now, all these mentions add up to the final and most interesting description of the sea beast in the Bible within the book of Job. Here, a man named Job has his faith in the Lord tested by a Satan. Over the course of the book, the poor man's life is torn apart, and it causes him to have a complete breakdown, upon which God speaks directly to him. Job asks God why he would treat his loyal servant in such a horrible way, to allow such evils to befall him. God responds by asking Job who it was who gave each animal their unique circumstances. Who gave the horse such immense strength and will for battle? The hawk the ability to soar so swiftly and have unparalleled vision. Each one was created by God. But all these animals have been tamed by man and understood. So God shows Job a beast no man has ever truly seen before. The Leviathan is laid bare before him. God describes the beast in tremendous detail, stating, Who can open the doors of his face with his terrible teeth all around? His rows of scales are his pride, shut up tightly as with a seal. One is so near another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another, they stick together and cannot be parted. His sneezings flash forth light and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights, sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. Strength dwells in his neck and sorrow dances before him. Here, God uses the example of the horribly terrifying Leviathan as a means to convey his supremacy over the world and that he has created innumerable things. God does not see in the same manner as humans do. He does not feel as humans do. He does not think as humans do. While the world is horrible and evil to some, to most, the world simply is, and to assume you know better than the one who created it is asinine. His thought process is beyond any one person's imagination. From this original description of the beast Leviathan, we can come to understand his more modern occult interpretations. It's uncertain if Leviathan was ever a denizen of heaven or simply a primordial beast whose vastness and might dwarfed any other being of the earth. The creature's size was described as even being larger than the earth itself, which led many to believe it was not so much a physical being, but rather a godlike entity or spiritual creature, much like an angel. Being one of the first creatures to inhabit the corporeal space, he was insatiable and aimed only to devour, which threatened the natural balance of the world. God and his angels struck at the beast, cutting off portions of his body, which coincided with the events of the war in heaven. As Lucifer and the fallen angels fell alongside the beast, the Leviathan thought only of consuming more and more. Being a spiritual being, however, the creature consumed all things outside of the physical world. Lucifer and his newly created demon kind found a home inside the Leviathan's vast body, which was dubbed as Hell, whose fires roared hotter than anything thought possible on Earth, bubbling up from the belly of the beast. Now there exists two gates in the afterlife, the gate to heaven and everlasting peace, and the mouth of the Leviathan to hell and everlasting torment. The great beast Leviathan seethes with the envy of his past power and the need to consume all things. 
to grow ever larger in a bid to encompass the entire universe in his great size. Leviathan's depictions in artwork rarely portray him in his entirety, as he is much more than any one canvas can do justice. With a head much like a great demonic lion, he is shown devouring the souls of sinners to be sent to the depths of his fiery belly, whose size makes up the entire underworld. A truly terrifying beast, and one of the most interesting beings in all of Christian canon. To understand Mammon, we must first understand his domain, Greed. Greed, also sometimes called avarice, is an extremely difficult sin to fully understand. Greed is something we all instinctively assume we know, but when asked to define it, the task is far more difficult than we might think. Greed is officially defined as an intense and selfish desire for something, especially wealth, power, or food. But in truth, this is a nebulous explanation when asked to attribute it to a specific person. One might assume selfishly desiring money is greed, but that's inherently flawed. Someone may desire the money they are owed for a day's work, to use for their own wishes and mainly for their own self-enrichment, and there is nothing wrong with that. One might assume not giving money to the needy is greedy, but in truth, if you have earned that money, you deserve to spend it however you like. Money and assets throughout history were finite, either you had it or someone else did. The same is true now. To own something is inherently depriving someone else of having it in turn, whether it be money, a job, or something as small as a piece of food. And the desire for these things that increase our quality of life is not inherently evil. In fact, it's necessary for our survival. I say this, but I trust most people understand these distinctions. There is a line between self-interest and greed. With all this taken into account, however, understanding greed isn't as difficult as it may seem. Greed, much like all other sins, is simply a human desire taken to the extreme. Wanting to acquire wealth, safety, and comfort for yourself and your family is fine and virtuous, but when taken to the extreme, it can have dire consequences. Greed is the insatiable desire to acquire more and more, far and above what is your own individual need. Due to the introduction of currency, that is the main subject of greed now, and it has become so ubiquitous that people think money is the root of all evil. But money is not evil, it simply is. It can be used to bring prosperity to a group, feed the poor and fulfill the needs of many, or it can be used to compromise the morals of people, give rise to violence and oppression, and destroy the trust of your fellow man. There are many passages in the Bible and other holy texts that warn us of humans' susceptibility to greed. Within the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew, there is a strong warning against the act of greed and worrying of material possessions, stating, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon the earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and money. Here we can understand that greed was thought of as valuing material possessions above being a holy and virtuous person. Said directly from Jesus, valuing worldly possessions like gold, fine clothes, and extravagant meals in and of themselves preclude us from living a good and just life. You would be fundamentally unable to understand what it means to do something for the benefit of another when you are so used to thinking only of what can benefit you. A self-serving attitude is incredibly insidious, as you may not even be aware of your outlook towards other people. In this case, even giving money to the poor can be seen as a greedy act if the only reason you do it is to simply appear good and virtuous to your fellow man, when in truth your soul is black. In almost every religion, the pursuit of worldly desires and carnal pleasures is the abject enemy of true happiness and understanding of the world. Whether or not you're religious, the core tenets espoused by holy texts, like the Bible, are core to proper social cohesion, in addition to hopefully getting us that one-way ticket to heaven. Universally understood positive qualities in a person like humility, compassion, and generosity directly oppose greed in all forms, but in truth it's much easier said than done. 
When a person finds themselves in a position where their sole sources of happiness come from material things like money, food, and influence, the happiness derived is always transient by nature and can be taken away as fast as it's given. This leads to a constant state of fear and paranoia, leading to more extreme forms of greed, like hoarding wealth and actively sabotaging others' attempts at success for fear it will adversely affect you. Ultimately, it would be one thing if wealth made us happy, but in truth, everyone knows that there is no such thing as enough. Humans are inherently goal-oriented, and when you complete one goal, you move on to the next. Acquiring a million dollars is a goal, but if you achieve it, you won't just stop. And at that point, you'll have much more means to acquire money. Your goal will get higher and higher, over and over again until you look back at all the people you left behind, opportunities you lost, and sometimes even lives ruined, and wonder, what was it all for? Spending a majority of your life only thinking about yourself makes it easy to turn a blind eye to the injustices it causes. Businesses ruin the environment, and governments destabilize entire nations in the pure pursuit of greed and self-enrichment. In this finite world, there is only so much that can be taken before there is nothing left to give. There is an alternative, however, and as mentioned, it was found many years ago. A person must not derive their value from the material world, but rather through the love and happiness of others. Love and virtue is far stronger when it comes to bringing happiness to a person's heart than any fine clothes or gold coin. Once our bellies are filled and our backs are clothed, look to your friends and your family and build with them a life worth living. These relationship bonds are stronger and longer lasting than anything you can buy. This is most succinctly put also in the book of Matthew, where the Pharisees questioned Jesus on whether or not it was justified to pay taxes to Caesar. It states, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute unto Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? Show me the tribute money. And they brought unto him a penny, and he said unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. Then said he unto them, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and unto God the things that are God's. When they heard these words, they marveled, and left him and went on their way. Anything in this world is never truly yours, and never will be. So do not want for coin. Want for peace and love. Now on to the supreme prince of greed, Mammon. The origin of the word mammon comes from the Latin word mammona, meaning simply wealth. But in the New Testament of the Bible, the term was usually used to describe a more pointed aspect of wealth. Mammon was mostly used to describe a concept, either being base material wealth or potentially an entity that promises wealth in exchange for something, almost like a demon. Both the Gospel of Luke and Matthew quote Jesus directly using this word. Remember earlier when I quoted the Gospel of Matthew saying, Ye cannot serve God and money? Well, the actual direct translation is, Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Here it can be assumed that mammon is a more specific term when it comes to the definition of wealth. Where sometimes wealth is used as a state of prosperity in a poetic sense, like one might say they have a wealth of love for their family or a library has a wealth of knowledge, in context of the word mammon's use in the Bible, it is specifically used to describe worldly material possessions as well as a mindset of achieving ever more. How can you serve God when you truly only serve the acquisition of coin and material possessions? It's simply impossible. Within the Gospel of Luke, it again quotes Jesus explaining the mindset of people when they face mammon. In it he says, And I say to you, make friends for yourself by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Once again, Jesus repeats the words of wisdom in Matthew with another example, here explaining how trust is of the utmost importance, and betraying that trust, no matter how small or inconsequential it may seem, reflects on you and your soul more than you can possibly imagine. If you steal $5 from me just because you think it won't matter, why would I let you borrow 500 
No matter the amount, the trust has permanently been broken. If you're willing to betray the trust of your fellow man simply for material wealth, you have no right to think you have earned anything. Thou shalt not steal is a commandment for a reason, and it's much more than just you took what was someone else's. The act itself erodes at the social cohesion of a group, sowing mistrust, hatred, and envy. From the understanding of the word mammon, we can begin to understand how the phrase itself would be personified as the pursuit of material possessions at all costs. Whether it be to the detriment of your relationships or even your eternal soul, when the word fell in popularity it took on another form. The mindset of greed and pursuit of the vain in people was brought on by mammon. But who was mammon? Why, a demon of course. What started as simply a concept of greed was later given form in the great demon Lord Mammon. Later works such as John Milton's Paradise Lost describe Mammon as once an angel in heaven who paved the walkways of God with gold. But in time he began to care more of the price and quality of the metal than the veneration of the Most High, and in turn was cast out of heaven along with Lucifer. Mammon surprisingly accepted his exile, as when he fell to the earth, he still had access to the gold and other material wealth he held so dear. Through him, the people of the earth learned the value of possessions, stating, By him, first men also by his suggestion taught, ransacked the center, and with impious hands, rifled the bowels of their mother earth, for treasure better hid. Soon had his crew opened into the hill a spacious wound, and digged out ribs of gold. The Dictionnaire Infernal by Jacques Collin de Plancy, written in 1818, corroborates the same story as John Milton, stating he was the demon who taught humans to seek power through treasures, and to justify the means to acquire it at all costs, even if it meant destroying the very earth itself. His classification as a prince of hell and explicit association with the deadly sin of greed came from as early as 1409, from the Lantern of Light. This text aimed to attribute a specific demon with a specific deadly sin, with Mammon being that of greed and avarice. There are very few depictions of Mammon the demon throughout history, but perhaps the most famous depiction is within the pages of the Dictionnaire Infernal mentioned before. Here he is simply an old man, no more demonic than you or me, blending in with society but ultimately bringing about its downfall. Perhaps Mammon is a demon that invades the minds of humans, driving them to ransack the earth and its people much like he did after his fall from heaven. Or perhaps he is simply a convenient way to exemplify the negative attributes of always wanting more and more. Money is essential to life, whether we like it or not, and there's no such thing as enough money. But the ability to live within our means and use what we have to help ourselves and our community will bring much more reward than any material good. The health and happiness of loved ones will always be more rewarding than a new pair of shoes. I guarantee it. To begin with, before going into the deeper lore of either figure, it should be understood that these two figures are in fact different entities. Kind of. Let's discuss their first appearances in the Bible. Lucifer is first mentioned in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, where it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High, yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. Here we see Lucifer set up in no small parts as the supreme evil of the world, a being so vile and powerful his mere existence weakens the nations of men and forever plagues our lives. There are other possible interpretations of Lucifer in the Bible, such as the serpent in Genesis, but for concrete mentions this is the first. The first mention of Satan in the Bible is in the Old Testament's Numbers 22, with the story of Balaam, the donkey, and the angel. Balaam was a man living in Moab, ruled by King Balak. Preceding the freeing of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, they began to proliferate under the guidance of God, and even take over nearby settlements like Jericho. Balaam was knowledgeable in the ways of curses as well as blessings. So knowledgeable, in fact, that King Balak enlisted his services to bring woe to the people of Israel. In any other circumstance, Balaam would have gone through with the king's orders, but this time God spoke directly to the sorcerer. God commanded Balaam not to curse his chosen people. But when he told the king he could not go with him, Balak took the man by force. Riding his donkey, Balaam rode out to meet the king and, then God's anger was aroused because he went, 
and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an adversary against him, and he was riding on his donkey, and his two servants were with him. The word Satan in Hebrew is often translated to the word adversary, or simply one who opposes. Other, more literal translations of this excerpt are, Balaam's departure aroused the wrath of Elohim, and the angel of Yahweh stood in the road as a Satan against him. This angel stood in the way of Balaam, with his sword drawn, and when the sorcerer noticed him, he bowed to the ground and said, I have sinned, for I did not know you stood in the way against me. Now, therefore, if it displeases you, I will turn back. The angel instructed Balaam to go along to King Balak, but only speak the words the Lord puts in his mouth. When it came time to curse the people of Israel, Balaam blessed them seven times, unable to speak anything other than God's word. From these stories, it's easy to understand that these two beings are separate entities. Lucifer is clearly portrayed as a being wholly against the will of God, and does everything in his power to destroy and tempt humans. Where the second stories, Satan was explicitly an agent of God, sent to convey his message and protect the blessed Israelites. In later stories from following biblical books, there are other entities carrying the title of Satan, in considerably less benevolent circumstances. The book of Job centers around an angel questioning or opposing God's faith in a particularly holy human named Job. God spoke of Job in glowing praise, describing how virtuous he is to all the other angels in heaven. One particular angel confronts God, arguing that Job is not virtuous because he is a good man. He is simply virtuous due to the blessings of God given to him from birth. Now donning the title of the Satan, the angel argued that if Job faced considerable hardship, his faith would surely falter. God decided to keep his faith in Job, and allowed this Satan to do with Job's life as he pleased. Satan set to work torturing Job and dismantling his very life. You can learn more about this book in my Mastema video, who may be the Satan in this very story. Ultimately, we can come to the conclusion that Satan isn't even an entity per se, simply a title donned by one who opposes. From context, we can surmise that Satan is specifically used in religious circumstances, for angels or agents of the Lord. Lucifer, on the other hand, is clearly only one entity. With the stories explaining Satan established, let's explain Lucifer for contrast. Before Lucifer was a prince of darkness, he was a being residing in the seventh layer of heaven, God's throne. Only angels of immense power and trust could be in direct audience with God, and Lucifer was one such angel. He was a seraphim, one of the highest orders of angels, who had six wings and sang the Trisagion to God. Though some believe he was an entirely different creation. Lucifer was born to be the perfect being in all ways, a beautiful body unparalleled by anything in heaven or the earth, a keen mind able to outwit any in the universe, and the skill to overcome all challenges. Lucifer was even said to be the minister of music in heaven, and considering the importance of singing the Trisagion prayer to God in his throne, this was an incredibly important job. Time passed, and Lucifer began to recognize his abilities were orders of magnitude above all others in the kingdom of heaven. Eventually, Lucifer would go so far as to believe his power was greater than God himself. Over time, Lucifer managed to amass an army whose number was one-third of all angels to fight against God and instate himself as the ruler of all. The plan was sure to work, if only Lucifer did not have one deadly sin, pride. God sent Michael to do direct battle with Lucifer, a being of higher strength and martial prowess. To any other angel, it must have seemed like a suicide mission. Michael took the orders without hesitation, however, and Lucifer battled the Archangel. The fight was intense, but in the end, without question, Michael was the winner. Lucifer took too much pride in his body to get scarred, too much pride in his intelligence to be outwitted, and too much pride in his ability to retreat. All these added up and it led to his downfall. In the end, he was cast out of heaven, never to return. Those one-third of angels who brought Lucifer to be their new father were cast out alongside him to become what we now know as demons. The being who was once so great as to be called the Morning Star had now fallen to the absolute depths of hell. With his legion of angels who still harbor a portion of the divine power they once did, Lucifer aims to lead man astray and be the ultimate adversary, or Satan, to God. While Lucifer is a Satan to God, it would do him very little justice to simply call him adversary. He is the adversary of God, and the only one in all of existence to ever challenge him for his position, along with the undeniable ability to persuade even angels against God with his guile and charisma. Lucifer is no mere fallen angel. He is the catalyst of human suffering and doubt. 
He is the reason man suffers still to this day and is unable to see the truth of the world. In the Gospel of John, there is concrete mention of Lucifer's influence on humans, here called the devil. After his famous forgiveness of the adulterous woman with the line, Let ye who is without sin cast the first stone, the Jews who doubted him surrounded Jesus and began to question him. They said God was their father, but then, If God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. From this, we can extrapolate that Lucifer's hold on mortal perception is so great that even the word of God cannot reach the people so many years after the morning stars fall. Later in the book, Jesus utters the words, Before Abraham was, I am. I am being the way God introduced himself to Moses as the burning bush with Ehia, translating to, I am. Even after all this, the people did not see the truth. All those who dwell in sin fall to the temptations of Lucifer. His hold on us is so profound that when good deeds are done, we come to understand that they please God. When bad deeds are done, they please Lucifer. And yet the temptation of sin, to some, is much more alluring than any good deed. While Satan could be any adversarial agent of God, he isn't necessarily evil. As portrayed in Numbers, this can be one who opposes those who would do God's people harm, though that term was rendered antiquated by the time of Jesus. Where Satan was a term used once for many entities, more recently, Jesus seems to have been the last heavenly being brought upon the earth to oppose the will of tempted humans, though revelations is still yet to occur. The next major event prophecy to come is in one such book of Revelation. The seals on the scroll of God would be broken, the four horsemen would ride and destroy the earth, and then God would create a new heaven and a new earth. In Shin Megami Tensei, Lucifer is portrayed as a less objectively evil tempter and more in a mix of the Gnostic and Abrahamic interpretations of him. The Gnostic interpretation being that the supreme being of our world is simply the creator of earth. Earth being the world of strife and suffering, the creator of it, therefore, must be evil. While the true father is something greater, something beyond. You can learn more about that in my Demiurge video. Lucifer's aim is to set humanity free from their bonds to Yahweh and create a world where they can rule. Though oftentimes this involves a strict survival of the fittest mentality so he may not be as benevolent as he first appears. He is the prince of lies after all. To understand his design, we must ask what type of angel was Lucifer? I lightly touched on it previously. Well, that's a really difficult question to answer. From what we know, Lucifer believed himself to be greater than God and was said to be the most beautiful creature to have ever lived. Master of music and all things pleasing, presumably he had some power in the kingdom of heaven and was in relatively close proximity to God. With his multiple wings and power comparable to the strongest of the nine orders of angels leads me to believe he was a seraphim. Lucifer means light and is symbolically the morning star, so it would make sense that he is one of the burning ones. Now, not burning with God's light, but burning with envy and wickedness. Some say he was even the prince of all seraphim, and when he was cast down from heaven, we know one third of all angels fell alongside him. The specifics are unknown, but from interpretations of certain passages in the Bible, principalities and powers are viewed as the main forces of Lucifer on earth tempting mortals. According to Catholic demonology, Lucifer along with Leviathan and Beelzebub were the first to be cast out of heaven for their transgressions, each representing a different sin, most of all, pride in Lucifer. From this, his design is perfect. Six pure white wings, long flowing hair, flawless skin, and fair features. He lives up to his status as the most beautiful creature to have ever existed. As for Satan, his depiction is spot on as well. They are portrayed consistently from as early as SMT2 as an agent of God, not wholly evil. In Shin Megami Tensei 2, he first opposes the player, and if deemed worthy, he follows you to the kingdom of God where, still as an agent of Yahweh, continues to judge sins. Except this time, it's Yahweh's themselves. 
In Shin Megami Tensei 4, he is a boss guarding the door to Yahweh's throne and opposes the party as they lay siege to him. After being defeated, however, he allows passage. From these, we can understand that Satan is a figure who tests the will of man simply to see their resolve, whether that resolve is to enact the will of Yahweh or go against it. The design doesn't have so grand an explanation as Lucifer did, but there's still a lot to chew on. Just looking at it, it's difficult to discern what kind of creature this even is. It has six wings, six arms, and six breasts, signifying the mark of the beast, and it has a segmented skull and serpentine body, possibly to signify the leviathan or the draconic form Lucifer took when fighting Michael. The design is possibly an amalgamation of all Satans, from biblical texts and the ultimate evil form. I love the design either way, and these two characters are the first demons I think of when I think of Shin Megami Tensei. Well, that covers each of the Princes of Hell. Some of the videos were formatted in different ways since they were recorded so far apart in time, but I still think they got the point across of explaining these immensely powerful beings. Even after covering every single one, I still have to say Leviathan is the most viscerally terrifying. Special thanks to Andre Venetius da Silva Valens, Anton, Arctic Mirror, Kalos, Goose Kebab, Jeter Michelle, Just a Middleman, Matt M, Patty123, Stuart Ash, The Digital Dutchman, Video Gamer 75 and many more for supporting the channel on Patreon. If you'd like to support, check the link in the description below. Thanks for watching this Royal Demon Roundup, and I'll see you in the next Tony for You. Have a good one.